Kia ora koutou Fana. Welcome to episode one of the summer series of Big Hairy News. Uh, we have 12 episodes for you over the next few weeks where we are highlighting some of our favourite bits and some of the interesting conversations from the year as we uh, have a bit of a break and recharge for 2024. Uh, so this is episode one. It is the 27th of December as you are watching this. And we want to have a look tonight at Associate Professor Grant Duncan. He joined us earlier in the year to talk about why the left always loses. Probably quite appropriate now, seeing the left just got smashed in the last election. Uh, also, uh, Christopher Luxon has a bit of a habit of not answering questions. Uh, you might have noticed that. Well, one of the videos we're going to play for you tonight is one of the times we analysed that and had a look at uh, when he refused to answer questions and what that meant. This was all pre-election, so interesting to reset again now with the knowledge of what we've seen post-election as well. And also, uh, I don't know if you remember, but during the year, the Greens had a challenge to James Shaw um, for his leadership. We couldn't quite figure it out and couldn't quite get to understanding uh, what the story was with it. Uh, and how the Greens uh, inner circle works and their supporters work. So we got on Julianne Genta to have a bit of a chat about all sorts of things, and that was one of the questions we asked her as well. Now, in that episode, we had uh, Chewy was away, so we had Penny Ashton filling in for Chewy. So that's a little clip with me and Penny Ashton having a chat to Julie and Genta. bunch of other stuff we'll uh, do as we go through this next wee while, but uh, be safe over summer. Uh, if you're drinking, don't drive. Uh, hug a loved one. Be close to them and keep yourself safe. But uh, for right now, this is episode one of the summer series of Big Hearing News. From Massey University, Associate Professor from the School of People, Environment and Planning, it's Associate Professor Grant Duncan. Grant, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Good to be Hi, with Grant. you. And I'm sure you're enthralled right. about getting a receipt every year from a national government telling you where the tax, tax money is going to be spent. So, Look, hurrah. I'm one of those my receipt from the supermarket. <laughs> budget at a glance document they put it out every year that's that's the place to look now for people who want to anchor you grant um we reference you quite a lot on this show because you're probably the person who pulled us over the coals a little bit for taking too much notice about projected results to election day and how much we don't now look at you know that this is what it would look like in the house we do look at polls and we do look at what they uh, what, what it is for today, but you're probably we need to probably give you credit for the person who kind of dragged us away from taking too much attention to what the uh, what this would project. In fact, what did we have last week, Chewy? There was a um a, one of the it might have oh was it the tax the the, the Curio uh, Taxpayers Union poll? Basically, oh, yes, the yeah, headline yeah. read that we now didn't need an election because they were telling us that National Act could get there by themselves. And we thought that was good because that will save us a lot of time and money just to cancel the election and let the uh, taxpayers union tell us that. Day back. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good thing. So that just to anchor you for our audience as to you, we reference you quite a bit. Certainly we reference your idea around that quite a bit and we've taken it on board. So thank you, sir, for adding to our show. Glad to be helpful. Now, let's have a look at this, shall we? Uh, let's start with uh, a, a substack that you have written. Now, if people want to read this for themselves, there is actually a link in the description, I think, on all of our places we're broadcasting right now. So whether you're on YouTube or Facebook or maybe not on Twitter, but on the other two, there's a link to your story to go and check it out. Um, you've written a piece this morning uh, simply titled, How Do the Left Lose? I will read out one little paragraph and then I want to throw it to you, uh, Grant. This is a conversation that we've had quite a, quite a lot here. And let's flesh it out a bit. Um, you've said this, as with the defense of free speech, however, the baton of civil rights has now been passed from left to right. Why have, they, have the left given their hard-won prizes away to their opponents to own and defend? It's like giving, uh, giving away one's savings to the employer who, the, who, who paid the minimum wage. So let's have a look at this and let's have a, uh, I guess, the open-ended question to ask with is you can just tell us from your thoughts, your writings, your meanderings, uh, how do the left lose, in your opinion? Well, they fight one another. That's how they lose. Uh, and they accuse one another of things. And, and I mean, people do behave badly sometimes. You know, people do say rude things or, or you know, look, I'm an academic. Um, I do my best not to offend anyone. But, um, <laughs> you know... I, I am conscious of, of, you know, I use my free speech, but I'm conscious as an academic with academic freedom, using that freedom responsibly. But, you know, you just never know when something that you say might come across wrong to someone. And I think it is okay for us to, you know, register objections to say, hey, I don't think that's right. Um, but I think one of the problems that's happening in the left at the moment is the 
uh, virulence of accusations against people uh, for supposedly offending others. And so, as I say, it's, it's okay to call people out, but I just think tone it down a little bit. Be, uh, that would be, uh, you know, showing a bit of self-discipline because the way that the left will lose this election, well, not the only way, but one of the ways in which they'll uh, lose this election is by carrying on with the infighting that we've seen recently. Let me bring an example to you of what you're saying, because I reckon there's a jump the shark moment as well. And I think the jump the shark moment of attacking one's own happened last week with Elizabeth Kirikiri. I want to play you a clip, a very, it's only 15 seconds, uh, because Elizabeth Kirikiri, as a part of her defence of herself and her, the accusations of bullying, decided she would go on attack by claiming that there was racism issues within the Green Party. Oh, definitely a racism problem in the Greens. All of the work that I have done around helping restructure the party and and focus on um, how we give life to Te Tiriti. I think a lot of our supporters will be really, um, really disappointed. So is that a concrete example of what you've just talked about, how the left attacks itself? Now, I know Elizabeth Kirikiri is kind of defending herself because she's been going through some stuff, but I know Chewie and I have experienced it in this show and others that um, the other thing that happened with, with um, Ms. Kirikiri is the reports that were coming out about her bullying says that she, I guess I'll say the the accusation from within is that she does throw that kind of label around a lot. In other words, it seems that what happens is the accusation of you being a bad person is more so than the content of the argument we're having amongst one ourselves. Is that sort of an example of what you're talking about? Uh, well, it's an example. And, and whilst I wouldn't want to stop uh, Elizabeth from saying what she's saying, I would question why she's saying it in the media. And secondly, um, the, the other remarkable event was, of course, I think uh, the other Saturday morning uh, when James and Marama had to be cross-examined by the press about that whole investigation. Now, politically, that is a colossal waste of time. That is the Green Party's co-leaders talking to the media about internal squabbles rather than talking about climate change rather than talking about what they would like to be doing if they were sitting at the cabinet table after the next election, and therefore taking away from their impact on the next election. So, I mean, I'm not. it's not for me to say who was right and wrong in that whole argument, really, because I wasn't there. I'm not a Green Party member. I wasn't in the room when those things happened. Um, but all I'm saying is that uh, that kind of accusation made public uh, is bad for uh, the electoral prospects of any political party. Um, it reminds me a little bit, and I, I'm still not quite sure whether I believe this, honestly, but I, re I remember hearing um, that apparently, I'm still shaking my head in disbelief, but um, I heard um, that a lot of um, left-wing NGOs and lobby groups in, in Washington, D.C. nowadays their management is spending most of their time dealing with internal complaints of one staff member against another and that kind of thing. Wow. Um, and so a lot of wasted energy goes on in left-wing organisations as people deal with and investigate. And you know, it takes time. If a person lodges a complaint, I've had one against me in the past. I know what it's like. You guys, it sounds like you've had them too. When people <laughs> lodge complaints, it, it's... <laughs> takes time to deal with these things properly. It is wasted effort. Um, it, it, it distracts from your political objectives. And of course, it costs your organization money uh, that you could be, you know, and time that you could be spending on something more productive. The reason I reference this as a jump the shark moment as well is, I mean, as you say, we weren't there, we don't know the full truth, but if you were to list off all the political parties and statistically put where do you think racism is going to be active, I think the Greens would be at the bottom of the list. And I and I feel like that uh, Elizabeth Kirikiri's comments have got no traction, and I wonder if that's because everyone can kind of go, look, you're, it's okay if you're angry or upset, or but, but I, and look, we're not really going to buy into that, at least that argument it feels pretty unlikely that that party would be the place for it. I was going to say as well, Grant, you're right about when we have complaints that we have, but we've got a new system. I can show you our new system for complaints here, HOE. It's, it's this. This is our new system for complaints. <laughs> they go in here. So from now on, our complaint system is pretty streamlined, that, wouldn't you say, HOE? That's new. I assume you bought that over the weekend. <laughs> Any thoughts you want to take up there, Chewy? Yeah, they're easy. You just, you just do this, and then you do that. It's harder to do this, so if it's on if it's on Twitter, you've got to kind of crush yeah. the screen. It's a bit more difficult to screw it up. But <laughs> what are your thoughts, Joey? 
I, I mean, my thoughts with Elizabeth's comments there is obviously, um, famously, the Green Party seems to be a hive of racism. Um, but th then I then I thought, well, hang on. Th there is also there's a lot of white lefties and a, a lot of a lot of white greenies, and there's also a lot of performative. Um, behavior in those groups of like of, of course of course we follow the treaty of course of course that's not even up for debate but so i wonder if, if it's that sort of aspect that she's speaking to again i'm not part of the green party i haven't been privy to any of these meetings or anything like that i would love to know um what examples and what people she's talking about but obviously we're not not probably not going to hear about that yeah but yeah i i, I agree it's it's there's a lot of lot of energy I mean, this story would have died on the vine if uh, the Greens behaved like any other party and went, it's internal, move on. Yeah. Let this, do you want to talk about our policy that we're bringing? Yeah, it shouldn't be in the news and we shouldn't be talking about it now. It should have been kept internal. Yeah. Um, back to your article. Let's have a look at another party article. This is what you say. In left social movements today, and I guess that's like whether it's an NGO, if you just spoke about, or a political party, uh, the principal aim seems to be preemptive accusation against somebody uh, supposedly offending somebody else. Mm. You know, we see that a lot in the media. Like someone will take umbrage for something that someone, let's just pick a comedian out of the, for, someone will take umbrage for something the comedian has said about another group of people when they're not part of that group of people, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but I, that's what I think of when I read what you've written there against somebody supposedly offending somebody else. And hence the prominent gesture is the pointed finger the pervasive effect then is fear the fear of being accused and cancelled to avoid being cancelled one accuses the other first so before you can get me i'm gonna fucking get you that's what we're gonna that's the game we're playing if this is the best that the political left now hopes for it may be because they've lost hope for collective action and a better future can you expand on that what you mean by that oh i think uh barack obama put it nicely didn't he when he talked about the uh, circular firing squad um you know where the left forms a circular firing squad and they shoot at one another uh they lose sight of the target now i'm not denying that people sometimes say offensive things um you know that happens and you know we can deal with that like adults i think well <laughs> we ought to be able to um and and you know debate things openly it's not about silencing people i think all I'm saying really in, in there is that I think that the left has lost sight of the goals. Okay. And that's why I, you know, reintroduced a little bit of history there about, you know, the struggles for uh, a universal suffrage, for uh, social security, the huge scrap that we had to defeat fascism in the 1940, I mean, real fascism as opposed to, you know, finger pointing, you're a fascist, um, you know, real world fascism, all right? Um, and the, the efforts that people went went to, ultimately partly in defence of uh, the principle of one person, one vote, and free competitive elections, and, and of course, the civil right to express ourselves politically, to disagree with one another, as well as to uh, express dissenting opinions. The right to dissent, uh, the right to freedom of speech, fundamentally was a left-wing cause originally. Uh, civil disobedience dissent, the struggle against the manufacturing of consent uh, in the big corporate media and so forth and the political clobbering machine and so forth. Those were left-wing objectives. Now what's happened is that um, those uh, left-wing prizes, so to speak, have been handed over to be defended, to be owned and defended by the right. Uh, one person, one vote. I know very well that it's been associated with the Hobson's Pledge group and things like that. I get that point, and I think that's what uh, Te Pāwhi Māori was saying when they objected to the principle of one person, one vote. But it's forgetting the struggle that went on, the long historical left-wing struggle that went on to achieve that as a principle of political equality uh, to end discrimination, to put an end to government by a landed minority. Um, and we just, you know, forgetting that history and forgetting those kinds of bigger objectives that the left wing ought to be fighting on behalf of the people 
in terms of, say, social security, housing, environment, all of those questions get lost when people start pointing fingers at one another, slamming doors, uh, walking out on one another, and making a scene in public about it. It's one thing to have arguments, another thing to let those arguments become public and, you know, they then become the story about your party. I, um, I can give you a real concrete example of that. It's not in New Zealand, but the ACLU. ACLU in America, massively left-wing um, political party, but were very much about freedom of speech first and foremost. Like They were the defenders of the freedom of speech. I've actually done a podcast with a guy called uh, David, I think it was David Goldberger. David Goldberger was a lawyer in 1967 who represented the uh, Nazis against, or was it? 78, oh, it was 78, uh, the Nazi group that wanted to march through Chicago. Jewish left-wing uh, lawyer defending the Nazis on their free speech with the ACLU, a left, primarily left-wing organization, but just the, the concrete version of freedom of speech. Within the last couple of years, and this is one of the reasons I spoke to David, he's kind of come out denouncing the ACLU because what they're doing now is they're picking and choosing what they can defend when it comes to free speech. And for example, I remember the conversation we had, and if people want to look it up, they can find it on my DOC podcast, is he was talking about, you know, issues would come into the ACLU about, you know, Trump, and they wouldn't take those cases. But they'd come in about some, you know, some progressive left wing, and they would take those cases. So this this left wing organisation has moved away from being a free speech purist, and as you say, uh, has handed it to the right, who are now the people who are able to say, say what you want. Yes, you're offended. Yes, I hate your speech, but say what you want. It really has flipped. It's a, it's a sad day actually. It's a, it's a sad indictment of the political left in general. I think. Mm, that's right. In a weird way, the. Um, I mean, if you took this to the extreme, and I'm not saying this will happen, but if you took it to the extreme, the left would more or less be asking for some kind of Stalinist ruler who would take those accused of offending someone out the back and just shoot them, um, <laughs> eliminate them that way. Um, and so there has always been an element on the left that is quite authoritarian, uh, a sort of centralising version of so-called democracy. Um, but the kind of democracy that I think works for us and works for other people around the world and which we really have to defend uh, these days does depend on political equality and freedom of speech. When I say political equality, we have a fairly good system in New Zealand now with proportional representation where everyone's vote pretty much has a close to equal equal voting in the final results. Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, the last part of your article um, talks about where to from here, what the left needs to do. Just, I'll ask you this before, and I, I said this before we came on here. Since I've been working in media, right, so this is 2000, right, late 90s, early 2000s, when I started to get into the news and current affairs world, I've said that in the Western world, the world over, the right does politics better than the left. The right speaks with one voice, even if it's a horrible voice, like you see the Ted Cruz's of this world not wanting to support Trump, but they get in lockstep behind him. So they do politics. When I say better, that's not, I'm not using that word meaning better as in better for us, but they play the game better and they play by their political rules better. The left have always seemed to me to be more fractured. And again, looking to America, you know, because Bernie didn't get in, a whole bunch of the Bernie voters went, fuck you all, we're not voting for anybody. So they don't seem, the left in general don't seem to want to get in line with the left. They seem to want to get in line with their party so it's more fractured and i firmly believe and if you have a look at the votes in most western countries that more people tend to vote for the left but because it's fractured it's one of the things that keeps the left versus right continuum more 50 50. like if you look at the the popular vote in america the left should have won all bar one of the last uh, you know since 20 1992 since all of those elections now they've got a different system but the idea of the right doing politics better and the left being more fractured, does that sort of line up with what you're saying as well? Because what I hear you doing is talking about the infighting of that, and that speaks to me of the fracture. Is that a similar sort mm. of thought we're going through? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a generally a little bit more sort of uh, discipline and, as you say, you know, um, uh, sticking together uh, in right-wing parties. I guess you could say that one of the sort of joyful sides of of the left is that there is more more debate, more argument, uh, a bit you know more fractiousness, and that's okay. Um, but I, I I think lately it's the kind of venomousness of some of these accusations that I think is is it, kind of scary. It's just it, it's gone to another level where um, you know uh, I, I guess uh, people want to uh, launch accusations with a certain kind of vigor 
that is really unnecessary. It's not achieving anything. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, is that, um, you know, we know also from quite a lot of research that to a large extent, the preferences of people on lower incomes aren't really sort of filtering through or being met in terms of actual policies mm -hmm. um, of, of governments, real world policies. The um, preferences of higher income people tend more frequently to be to be actually put into action or met in real world policy making. And so uh, the other reason, of course, there's other reasons why the left are up against it. Uh, people uh, on lower incomes are less likely to vote. And of course, you know, it's harder to get uh, campaign finance uh, from people on lower incomes as well. And we can see that in some of the uh, campaign finance figures just lately, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of reasons why I think, uh, you know, left wing parties are struggling. But I guess my suggestion simply in that article is don't make it worse for yourself by publicly infighting uh, and, and making the, the, the news cycle focus on your accusations against one another. Or um, I think, for instance, we're making up false allegations about how the principle of one person, one vote is racist simply because Hobson's pledge was using it. Yeah. Um, yes. As I say, yeah. That's, so, so that's the that's the metric. We've talked about this before, and I think we might, I might even talk about it with you, Grant. But you know that that Antifa rally that I've talked about numerous times in in America with the two old people holding the American flag as Antifa went past, and Antifa guys were all screaming "racist, racist, racist." And my position was, well, that old couple might be racist. We don't know. But the metric to decide that is not holding an American flag. That's hmm. not the metric right. to decide whether they are or aren't. So screaming it out like that seems to be pointless. Hey, Chilly, I've got one more question about this year, but do you want to jump in with anything as well? Yeah, look, I, I think a, a big problem, like, I mean, this isn't so much, I guess, with our political parties and that, but I think part of the Greens problem was that they want to, to really stick to those um, core tenets of being a transparent party. You know, uh, it was the same with the elite leadership debate and all all of that sort of thing is that they wanted to see that their processes were open and everybody could see. And that's so different from every other party, which is like, no, you can't see the machinery of what we do, um, that it sticks out. Um, and then when Elizabeth's gone, she's come out, she's come out swinging and she's come out with accusations that no one really expected. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, when we've seen other leadership uh, struggles or or, um, you know, uh, Sharma, uh, not a leadership struggle, but um, a bit of intra-party uh, drama. You know, we've got Sharma, we've got um, Nationals struggles and that sort of thing. And it is, it, it's, it's gossipy, bitchy stuff that plays really, really well in the news. But then when we're talking about, uh, I guess, in the left generally, I think one of the the, the biggest problems that the left have is the assumption that everybody is at the same point of the journey and there's almost a performative aspect of it to say i'm the most enlightened one i'm i'm i've got all of my ducks in a row and this person doesn't and must yeah. be shunned yeah so it's a really there, good there, there point there isn't... yeah yeah i think i think we, we we need to i mean i'm a teacher so you know, I kind of get that not everyone's at the same stage of the learning curve, mm. including myself. And so I would hope that if, if I screw up and say something that someone thinks is off key, that they'd have a little bit of toleration when they correct me, uh, just as I would do for my students, you know, because occasionally students say uh, off key things in class. It's incumbent on me to find kind ways of pointing it out and shifting the conversation in a different direction. And honestly, occasionally I do get some jaw droppers uh, that I have to deal with. Um, on both the left and the right, you know, just some sort of interesting comments come out in class. I've got to find a way to contain what that person has said without humiliating them in front of the other students. Mm. And yet also showing that I'm trying to correct things can be quite difficult to do in, you know, in the in the moment, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but we have to find ways of, uh, yeah, it, it's just as you said, you know, understanding that we're at different stages in a, a learning process. So if someone says something that doesn't seem to be up with the play in terms of, you know, where the current left-wing thinking is about this or that, 
please just extend them a little bit of toleration and care and try to help them along mm. that journey in a, in a gentle sort of way, understanding that we don't all understand things equally. But it's not even just though understanding, because understanding implies that the the enlightened person has the correct answer. I mean, we mm. figure out this mm. along the way, and there's lots of things that we're figuring out. And one of the things that's hardest is in this journey of figuring shit out, someone taking authority position of absolute truth does nothing but cause conflict because yeah. we're, we're, we're traveling through this universe together at the moment, figuring things out. And when we get to the end of the part of the journey for this bit that we're figuring out, we'll then know. But people talking in absolutes now about stuff that we're still figuring out, that's sort of what I hear. And I'm not necessarily saying it's for the left. We can say it's for anybody. That's what I hear as one of the big hurdles, because then, of course, when they put themselves up as the expert and they have gospel truth, they can then point to the other person using the finger and going wrong. You know, you're an X, Y, Z foe, whatever it is, or you're a, or you're an X, Y, Z bigot or whatever the thing is. And, and, and as Chewie was saying, I'm the enlightened one. But the truth is, the, these people often speak of a world in black and white. And I hate to inform them this, but we pretty much live in shades of greys and probably, I don't know, I won't put a percentage on it, but I'll just say most of our, most of our society is in the shades of grey. So absolutes are a pretty tough thing to handle, especially from people who are on the journey to finding if that truth is 100% right or partly right or wrong, who knows? Yeah, you know, I totally hear what you're saying there, Pat. And, and what you've just illustrated too is that thing where that virulent accusation is but behind it. What I'm saying is that behind it, I have to accuse you before I get accused. Yeah, exactly. You see, that's why I say it's preemptive accusation yeah. because I'm afraid of being cancelled. Therefore, I'm going to come out in front and, and, and do that accusation in front of everybody so everyone can see um, that I'm onto it. But this is, as I say, this is in a kind of intoleration, uh, but also it's, I think, fundamentally a waste of energy, honestly. Um, the last thing you write in your article, and we can wrap up with this because it would be good to get your take on it, is, um, mm. is basically where to from here. Meanwhile, all that the left as a whole need to do in order to lose this election is to carry on infighting, you say. What then? Might, uh, might a pathway forward look like. Left MPs need to recall their history and remember that they were elected to and, and get paid to work for the people and the planet. They could apply a at least a modicum of self-discipline and stop the finger pointing and door slamming. I think the thing I love about this paragraph is this bit about working for the people. And I, and I hear that every politician gets paid by the people. But the left seem to have lost that idea of they were originally the party of the factory floor. And and those people are, when you say recall their history, uh, is what I think of when I hear the history. Like when uh, Christopher Luxon came out in the last six months talking about the CEOs don't don't like Labour. Here on the show, we said, good, Labour, good. grab that. And, and, and you can say to the National, you guys can have the CEOs and we'll have the factory floor workers. Like they could have actually used that as a way to, as you say, recall their history. Anything else you can expand on for that kind of idea around what the left would need to do, in your opinion, in this upcoming election to kind of to kind of get over the line? Well, I, I guess perhaps I could have added there that actually um, we're only looking at a minority of left MPs who've called, caused all of this, these uh, ructions. Most of them are actually, I think, being quite disciplined. I probably should have added that in. Um, but I've just finished writing a column on the coming budget uh, for the conversation that will come out in the morning. And so um, well, I'm actually quite disappointed um, this emphasis on, um, you know, we're going to do the basics for the East Coast rather than build back better, um, just the basics, um, and the mm -hmm. budget is going to be all no frills. Now, this terminology, basic and no frills, uh, yeah. sounds to me like the lowest possible level of aspiration that you can have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would almost go so far as to say that these are code words for austerity budget. Um, we'll have to wait and see what it actually contains. Um, but I just find this incredibly disappointing. This, and, and you can see that the way, the thing that bugged me was the way that columnists in the media just picked up on this and just repeated this phrase, no frills, no frills, over and over again, as a, as become the mantra. And people are just swallowing it and accepting it, not saying, excuse me, can we have some 
bold ideas? Can we have some vision for the future, please? Especially from a Labour Party. Um, can we talk about building a better nation or something rather than just this really no ambition, no frills, absolute basics? That's all you're getting. Um, and I'm just wondering what some of those, you know, sort of basic rebuilt bridges in Hawke's Bay are going to look like. You know, are they mm. going to be? You know, why aren't we using this as an opportunity to improve that infrastructure? Yeah. yeah. Future proof it. I think you've also just vocalised the uh, the frustration of many of us for the whole last term. You know, a, a Labour government mm. that had a majority and could have done anything, could have been transformative. I mean, yes, you can look to point to COVID and say it was more difficult, but they still could have done stuff and they've chosen not to. And now they've come out the back of it. They feel like they have to be bland near the middle to try and get back in again. But I'm I'm mm. I'm with you because 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 COVID for them ended badly they've now got nothing to hang their hats on to say, look at what we did because they've been, they've been milk toast. You know, they've done, I mean, look, let's get me wrong. They've done very well with COVID overall. Not, I don't actually have many complaints here, but because that's the one thing that many on the right have picked up against to use against them, they have nothing else to then hang their hat on and say, but what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Because they haven't used that majority. So I hear you. Grant. Well, no, that is a squandered opportunity. And I mean, uh, Robertson has been talking and Hipkins have been talking a lot about skills and education in the coming budget. But when you look at what they've done, all they've done in tertiary education, for instance, was to amalgamate politics. And that really is a rolling disaster from what I can tell. Mm. Uh, you know, they've done nothing for universities. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, mass layoffs uh, at, at, you know, AUT, Otago. Uh, it won't, before long, it'll be massy. Um, and so, yeah, they've done nothing for us. Where, you know, once again, no, no aspiration. We, we, we're living in an age where we're about to uh, enter an era of, which is going to be run by artificial intelligence. Uh, we're not really doing anything. We're not using our tertiary mm. education system to say, hey, how are we going to get on top of this? How are we going to sort of join some of this innovation? But also, how are we going to explore what it will mean to be human what it will mean to be a good society in this new world that we're going into. We really need to be doing something about that. I don't hear this government saying anything about it. I don't actually hear our vice chancellors talking about it really very much. All they're, do, all they're doing is worrying about the effect of chat GPT on cheating. Um, no one's really asking these, <laughs> these questions. Yeah. <laughs> the obvious I questions. Yeah, that's true. Hey, look, Grant, thank you so much for joining us today. Associate Professor Grant Duncan from Massey University. Um, the School of People, Environment and Planning. Um, as we said in the in the link for this video, you'll get the link to the Substack. Uh, we love having you on, Grant, and you're welcome back anytime. Great I'm sure we'll talk again you super soon. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks for okay. your time, mate. All right. All the best. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou, Fano. Welcome back. Hope you're enjoying the summer series here on Bigger Hearing News. Wanted to let you know as well, we do have a little bit of stuff still going on on the merch shop. What a bit of a special through the summer period. Uh, there's actually one 5XL Big Hearing News hoodie left over that normally retails for $90. That may or may not still be there, seeing this is a pre recorded conversation. But if you're 5XL and you're in the market for a BH, uh, BHN hoodie, that may still be there if you want to go check it out. Uh, also, we've got a bunch of other things for sale. There's Beardy Boy product, there's caps, there's t shirts. They're all pretty cool. Uh, and whilst we're doing this through the summer series, uh, we're actually offering a summer sale. So everything on the website right now, including that BHN hoodie, if it's still there, uh, is 25% off. All you need to do at checkout is use the promo code SUMMER and you can get 25% off anything uh, in store. They will be getting sent out during the summer period. We are around, I am around in Dunedin uh, doing things like pulling up carpet. But if you're interested in supporting uh, what we do and you'd like to pick up some merch, it's bhnshop.nz. Uh, and as for now, let's continue with the summer series. I just wanted to show you again, because we talked about this last night about Christopher Luxon telling us, remember, he told us that this is a job interview. And my question was, if this is a job interview, have you ever been into a job interview, you and I, where someone's asked you a question and you then haven't answered it? How disrespectful and ridiculous that is. <laughs> so the first question today, we're not necessarily going to listen to much of the answer because there's two quick clips here before we go off for the week. The very first question uh, was about the tax being fair. Let's have a bit of a listen to it. Nationals leader has previously said he reckons our tax system is fair. Does he still think that in light of this news? Christopher Luxon joins us now. Morena, Mr Luxon, is the tax system fair? 
Good morning, Anna. Look, uh, the real challenge, or the real question here is, what's the point of David Parker's no speech answer. and all these no, reports? No, the, the real question is the one you just got asked. Is, is they want yeah. to shape for a capital answer raise it. tax, and Chris Hipkins is sitting on the fence, uh, not ruling it in, not ruling it out, but he needs to do so like his predecessors have done, because uh, you know what we want is not this distraction. We want this government focused and needs to be focused on actually dealing with rising interest rates, rising inflation, a slowing economy, and rising levels of unemployment. That's the thing that's going to help most New Zealanders. Hang on, hang on. Rising is levels of unemployment. What's the distraction about pointing out that the average Kiwi wage earner yeah. is what's paying twenty point two percent, and people who can realise their capital gains, those of us who might own seven properties in total, are not going to pay tax <laughs> on those and pay an effective tax rate of only eight point nine percent? That doesn't seem fair. It seems like it's worth pointing out. Well, look, what I'm just saying is so how much the wealthy own or don't own is is irrelevant to actually middle New Zealand. This is a really important point, right? He's going to start talking about it doesn't matter how rich the rich people are. That doesn't impact people. Now, we found out yesterday, was it 7,000 properties were owned by those 300 families? And if they're holding them in a literal land bank, of course that impacts other people. It's one of the reasons that potentially we have a housing shortage. You know, imagine if those 7,000 houses or properties, let's say half of them, I'm making up numbers, were went put, onto the, um, put onto the marketplace. Housing problems might be eased up so to try to, to, to say what he's about to say that it doesn't matter to the average person what these people make is, is just utter horseshit well look what i just say to you is how much the wealthy own or don't own is is irrelevant to actually middle new zealand who are really struggling with rising inflation rising interest rates oh, and a slowing economy Drop, and dropping and inflation in crisis, you know uh, i was in a dropping budgeting inflation. session uh, with a family who are at risk of losing their homes uh, what happens here uh, with the wealthy homes. and what they do or don't own doesn't impact on that uh, what they need is a tax break we're the only party offering them a tax break uh, and that's important because the middle income at the moment middle income earners in new zealand cannot get ahead they work incredibly hard. They have good jobs, average incomes, can't get ahead. And that's why we need a proper economic plan to run this country. No. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You say it's irrelevant, but it's not. They've missed out on $200 billion worth of tax that could have been clawed back from capital gains on property in this country. The middle income earners would not be feeling the pinch if the government had more money to invest in infrastructure and could help with more public programs because it collected more tax off capital gains. It's not irrelevant. L I, I, I totally disagree, Anna. The, the gro gross underpinnings here is actually this government. It has spent heaps of money. It has printed a lot of money. Uh, it has Keeping actually shut the economy it. down. And as a result, that is what has actually led to inflation. And that is what has led to this massive growth in asset classes or, or this asset price inflation that we've seen. Uh, and that is that is what's hurting you know middle-income New Zealanders. And that's why we're really serious. We're on the side of middle-income New Zealanders. We want them to be able to get ahead. But at the moment, for the last two and a half years, their wages have gone backwards. They're facing the risk of rapidly rising interest rates and whether they can afford their repayments. They're struggling with the price of food. That is all about how you run the economy and it's about how you manage your spending. It's about how you manage your monetary policy, all those kinds of things. This, that's what? what you've got. That's what, that's what this Labour government needs to do is develop a proper economic plan to actually help middle New Zealand. Uh, how, how much the wealthy do or don't own is irrelevant to that woman and that family sitting in a budgeting service trying to work out whether they're keeping their house or not today. It's irrelevant in that five minute meeting. It's completely relevant, completely relevant to the overall situation in the economy, which has put them in the position where they're sitting in that meeting. You know what I'm saying? Let, let, let's talk about how that could be relevant to that family. Okay. Maybe that budgeting service was publicly funded. Maybe it's had its funding cut and that person has to wait like a month or two to get a, an appointment to come and see a budgeting service. Yeah. Maybe it's from an NGO that, that gets its funding that way. Maybe that public funding helps uh, that person's kids go to a daycare centre so she can work more hours. And pay I more mean, th think about that number. You know, it's, 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 it's so facetious <laughs> what he's doing. And think about um, that number, so 200 billion, wrong. 200 billion is basically our GDP. So they, they, I mean, if let's say your salary was 60 grand, right? Imagine for some reason, if you got another 60 grand that year, or let's say 50 grand, because it's not quite the GDP, to, to help you fix up your house, do what you needed to do, to help you get rid of debt, that kind of stuff, you would be smoking it. So $200 billion in capital gains tax that we could have had, that would have, that other countries do do, like, like has been said, uh, well, sorry, I probably spoiler. It's about to be said, um, and that where would that have left this country in right now? 
yes, people would have paid more in tax. Yes, people own homeowners or business owners or property owners are probably the best would have paid more. But the country overall, that would have helped that squeeze middle a shit ton if the uber wealthy or the wealthy or the rich had a, a capital gains tax on, on their second or third properties, Joey. Let, let's talk about Luxon talking about um, rising un, uh, inflation. As, as you said, it's not rising at the it's moment. It's falling. Um, rising unemployment. W weren't they saying we had to cull like 700,000 jobs out of the market to tame inflation? Yep. Um, the, the, the government just printed money. Yes, keeping people in jobs during COVID. And alive. the workplace and without that, employers would have just cut bait. They would have sacked everyone. And, yeah. and those workers would have had to be paid somehow yep. through unemployment benefits. Like, the, God help us if they were at the wheel when COVID hit. Yeah. No, because this, very, this is the it, thinking that he that he has. It's well, it insane. would have been Simon, it would have been Simon Bridges who wanted to open up the borders immediately, and that would have had uh, a huge number of more dead New Zealanders. And we know that because all the other countries that did it, you know, one of one of our kindred countries, Western European countries, America has a better um, has a better inflation than us at the moment at five percent. Every other one, Australia, England, UK. Yeah. Uh, uh, through France, through all of um, Europe, European Union is all above us. So this is this um, current talking about. I'm just going to put the freeze frame up there because I'm quite enjoying looking at his face like that. I don't know why. It's just making me happy. Wow, um, yes, compasa, faces of delight. He's saying, um... Uh, and I just think that that there is pushback coming, and I've noticed it. I, I'm glad that all these journalists have been watching us for a wee while, too, because there is pushback coming. Mm. I mean, there is some pushback coming. So speaking of, let's have a look at this. This is when they talked about taxing people and capital gains tax. And then I've got a little bit to add on to that, and then we're pretty much done for the, for the week. Here we go. Okay, I, I'm going to assume that you are not against collecting tax, that you think that people should pay tax on their income. So I'm just curious as to why you're so opposed to a capital gains tax. Well, look, a capital gains tax is incredibly complex to implement, as we've seen no, it's in, not, it's in previous well, discussions Australia around does it. it, Canada does it, other OECD countries do it. It's not impossible. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And let me just say this. If Luxon's, if Luxon's um, like standard is it's too hard, then they are going to be a terrible government. Like if his standard is we're not going to do it because it's difficult, then what a, what a terrible mandate to take through into a government. I mean, I don't suspect that is there. Their position, I think it's a, the excuse right now for why he wants to say he's against it. I've got another reason that I think he might be against it, but let's just listen to this for a bit more. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and they also have high house prices and a whole bunch of other things so as well. We. That's why I'm saying the, the main task of this government <laughs> should be on running this economy properly for this. and not trying to blame the rich for the problems that they've got with the economy at the moment. The real reason is this is a government that was the second highest spending. It was the fourth highest in printing cash, and it shut down the economy like no other country on earth. And kept and more result, people alive domestic inflation. than most countries around the world through COVID. So we're leaving it there. Now, the question was, why would you be against why would you be against capital gains tax? Well, here's a reason that someone tagged me on today to remind me of. Mm -hmm. uh, new National Leader Christopher Luxon owns seven properties. Two of them are funded by taxpayers. New National Leader Chris Luxon has spent his first morning in the job, so as we want to go, defending his impressive property portfolio, which numbers seven buildings, two of which are effectively leased to taxpayers. Luxon is given a taxpayer-funded accommodation allowance to rent when in Wellington. Most MPs use it to rent flats or hotels, but some MPs buy accommodation in Wellington and use the allowance effectively rent the flats back to themselves. Luxon also owns his electric office in Botany. Electric MPs receive an allowance from Parliament to rent an office in their electric. Luxon recently bought a, uh, bought a building in his Botany electric, which he now rents to Parliament for his for his for for use, sorry, as his office, former Prime Minister John Key did a similar arrangement, da 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 da, da and as Helensville said, while not common in Parliament, the arrangement is not unheard of. Luxon's deputy, Nicola Willis, does it. Uh, she is the beneficiary of a trust that owns three homes. So maybe, maybe, maybe that's the reason that he's not really for a capital gains tax because it would personally impact him. Maybe that's the truth. Maybe. I, I, I love the fact that she chucked in the seven houses comment. It was it was amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, look, I'd, I'd love to say, look, I think it, because it will personally affect them. I think it's because it's his, his back. It's really going to crush his backers. 
Like, it's not too hard to do a capital gains tax because you know what? It's income. <laughs> it's just income. That's all. Um, and, and yeah, the comparison to like, oh yeah, those places that do capital gains tax, they've got they've got high house prices. Yeah, everywhere in the Western world has high tax prices because people like him got in and opened it up to investors, and the mm. people with the capital to gobble up these houses gobbled them up. Operators like Airbnb came up, and now it's more profitable to have your house used a couple of weekends a month than to have a family in it. You know, it's 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 just dog shit. Welcome back from the summer series. Hope you're enjoying the clips from the year as we all take a bit of a break over summer. There will be one of these broadcast every night at 9pm that we normally would be having a show. So that's not public holidays and not Friday or the weekends. So all the Monday through Thursdays between now and when we come back in January, there will be a summer series episode for you to enjoy some of the people we've spoken to over the year. Also want to say a huge thanks to all our patrons. Uh, you guys are beautiful and you know during the summer period, especially when things are slowing down and we don't see revenue from places like the merch shop as much or the views on YouTube, these are the people that help pay the bills. We've had a lot of uptake in the last wee while and a huge thanks to some of the people who have joined on in the last month. Um, if you uh, want to become a patron, all you need to do is visit patreon.com forward slash big hearing news. Uh, that is patreon.com forward slash big hearing news. Uh, all you beautiful people who have become part of what we do, we thank you very much. There's all our executive producers, our producers, our senior producers, our super patrons as well. But there's so many more people in here as well. There's a fuel level, a patron level, a coffee runner level. And because we're changing things up again a little bit in 2024, uh, there will be a lot more attention paid from us to the patrons and what you guys have offered us through this time period than perhaps it has been this year. Um, so if you're keen to get behind what we do, if you're keen to support what we do, uh, we'd love to have you as a part of our team, patreon.com forward slash big hairy news. Now, if you do become a patron during the summer series period, you may not see your name on the on the billboard until we come back. We'll see because these are pre-recorded. But if you want to be a part of it, we'd love to have you on board, patreon.com forward slash big hairy news. Right, uh, last clip now for the summer series uh, for this episode. Enjoy. How's the um, leadership situation going in the Greens at the moment? It seems like it was pretty big news two or three weeks ago, That, but that's still not sorted out yet. We're still finding out who's going to be Marama's co-leader. Is that the case at the moment? Well, the only candidate is James Shaw. But correct me if I'm wrong, because we were trying to figure this out on the show. You can have that, has to be 75% approval for someone to continue on. But now if there's 51% approval, is that enough for James? Or does he have to be 75% again? He does or have to get 75%. Yeah, yeah, he does have to get 75%. And uh, the, I guess one of the key things that probably wasn't communicated very well, even to members of the party, was that there was m many fewer votes than there could have been. So normally at a conference you you had 100 we had uh, 150 delegate places and uh last year when it was a contested leadership co-leadership um as thing there was 140 delegate votes cast wow. and at this one and i think this is because of covid being in the community and people you know kind of not wanting to attend an agm in person in the end it was online but it didn't get moved online until four days before the agm and so they were struggling to get people to be delegates uh, from around the country. And there were only 107 delegates attended and voted. So uh, that was quite a big drop, 107 out of 150. So it like there was uh, more votes not cast than votes reopen nominations against James. And right. presumably most of those delegate votes, if they had, they they probably would not have been reopened nominations because my guess, I mean, I can't say for sure, but my guess is that um, people who are happy with the leadership weren't motivated to show up and vote in this election because they didn't think they had to, right. you know. Um, so, so, so it's not. I mean, he still has to run a campaign and convince um, members to to vote for him and to get seventy five percent. But there were also changes to the delegate rules that were made um, at this AGM. So it's actually a different distribution of delegates now because. Uh, previously, the way our delegate rules worked, some parts of the country that had lots of members 
and lots of electorates, had lots of delegates in other parts of the country that had lots of members, but not so many electorates, like they were concentrated, lots of members concentrated in a few electorates, only had a few delegates. So um, arguably, you know, it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be a different set of delegates and there'll be different people who turn out to the meetings and maybe James will convince some of the people who voted for open nominations or maybe a lot more members will just show up and say we want James to continue. I mean, if they could vote, re if they voted reopen nominations again, I think that would definitely be a sign that, um, you know, that James should stand down. But I, I don't, I mean, I don't expect that to be the outcome. And I think the people who did vote so, reopen nominations wanted a contest and wanted someone to stand against him. But so your, expe your expectation is James will be James will be the leader, the co-leader. That's that's yes. your expectation. Because I'm from the outside looking in, the idea that, like, I understand we had a debate on this here with uh, George, and I was like, how can 30% of the people stop this happening? And George was like, well, no, no, 30% of the people voting has enabled something to happen, which is the, the nomination to be opened. So I'm like, oh, I can see how that works. But now that there is only one nominee, if those 30% come at the same vote, it does feel like they'll be stopping something, which does, feels a bit peculiar but then maybe I don't have the green mindset of, you know, making sure everyone's on board or whatever it is that, that, um, that, that could possibly happen. And it would, I just feel like it would be a bigger waste of your time and resources for the greens in particular to then spend X amount of weeks and months looking for another co-leader. And then that might happen again next year. I'm just like, Oh, anyway, just, just, just. Well, my, I, yeah. My and ranks. I don't know that um, people thought their reopen nominations were going to be successful. There might be some people who assumed it was just sending a signal and not that it would actually get over 25%. Um, and again, it was 30%, but it was 30% of way fewer votes than yeah. what would normally be. So, and that's, I think that if it had been 140 votes or 150 votes and it's still been 30% reopen nominations and we had really felt like, well, there's significant, like, you know, I think, you know, maybe James would have thought twice before putting his name forward again. I don't know. I, I probably shouldn't speculate on this, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, um, there was, there was enough of a question about whether or not this was really representative of how the members felt or whether it was just uh, that group was the, the people who were dissatisfied and concerned were overrepresented in the sample of delegates and the members showing up at branch meetings. Um, and so now we'll see.